Well, thank you very much for those mo that most kind and gracious introduction. You make me sound a heck of a lot better than I am in real life. <laughs> uh, most people think I just couldn't get out of school, I guess. Um, I'd like to begin by adding my congratulations to the family, faculty, guests, friends, and of course the graduating class of 2010. I'd also like to thank the university, the school, and the dean for offering me this opportunity to address you today. Now I'm sure despite that introduction that there might be some of you who are saying to yourself, what does this guy have to tell me about engineering? Well, I may have appeared to have traveled quite a way, quite a long way, since I last sat in the chairs that you occupy today. But in truth, I still use much of what I learned here in engineering in my work almost every day. That's because much of the improvement in the health of the public has been achieved and is still being achieved through engineering solutions. If you consider the large uh, in improvements in morbidity and mortality in this country over the last 150 years, they were not principally due to new medicines, safer surgery, or even vaccines, although I would note that engineers contributed to all of those also, but rather they were due to the provision of safe water, sanitation, cleaner energy sources, better transportation, better housing, all very much engineering solutions. As a matter of fact, one of the prime movers behind the organized public health movement in this country was a graduate of, of, the Columbia, uh, of Columbia Engineering. He was uh, an 1899 PhD graduate from what was then the Henry Crum School of Mines here at Columbia. And his name was George Soper. His work on the typhoid Mary epidemic in New York, in New York City in 1907, was the primary catalyst for the development of a new discipline called public health, which attempted to combine engineering and medicine, and which eventually led to the founding of the three, first three schools of public health at Harvard, Hopkins, and Columbia. So I think you can see that engineering and public health have a long shared history and are actually intimately connected in that both disciplines work to build a better world. In public health, we, vo we focus on that better world as being a healthier world. On my own personal journey from engineering to public health, as the dean has alluded, I did manage to accumulate a lot of degrees. And one of the corollaries of having done that, as well as being a faculty member for so many years, is that I have had the chance to hear dozens and dozens of last day and commencement speakers over the years. And I thought that this would surely be of assistance as I prepared to address you today. Oddly though, thinking back over all those speakers, all that came to mind was that they seemed to speak too long and that there was nothing in particular I could remember that they said. <laughs> this, of course, turned out to be very reassuring to me because I thought I can do that easily. I can drone on endlessly and say things nobody will ever recall. <laughs> And I have years of students behind me who would attest to that readily. <laughs> but as the day grew closer, I found myself thinking a bit more ambitiously. And keeping in mind that one of the greatest speeches of all times, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, was only two and a half minutes long, I decided it's time to break with tradition. I'm actually going to be brief and try to say something memorable. And I'm sure, right, I'm sure you'll be thankful for the former, if not the latter. Although I warn you, despite the beard, I'm no Abe Lincoln, so settle in. <laughs> Since this is an institution of higher learning, one of the great institutions of higher learning, I want to say something about higher education in particular, in general, and engineering education in particular. And the overarching theme that I would like you to consider with me over the next few minutes is engineering as a profession and the engineer as an agent of social justice, something you probably have not thought of before, although maybe you have. So let me start with a quote from someone who could be brief but memorable. Albert Einstein said, the world we have made as a result of the level of thinking we have done thus far creates problems we cannot solve at the same level of thinking at which we created them. I'm going to repeat that. The world we have made as a result of the level of thinking we have done thus far creates problems we cannot solve at the same level of thinking we have crea which created them. You have all spent years acquiring a level of thinking about engineering and science that operates on ascending levels of understanding. You are all well versed in the generation and collection of data, the analysis of data to create information, and the synthesis of information to produce knowledge. But the new level of thinking needed requires more than knowledge. Although I might usually be reluctant to quote somebody like Donald Rumsfeld on the subject of knowledge, and it occurs to me that many of you may not know even who Donald Rumsfeld is, but there is something to what he once said. He categorized knowledge as the known knowns that's the things that we know that we know. We have, the, we have the question and we know the answer. The known unknowns, the things that we know we don't know. We have the question, but we don't yet know the answer. 
And the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know, in fact, we don't even have the question. Something to think about. And that's where I, I, Robbie's mother comes in. Who's that? Well, this name I hope may be familiar to you. I, I, Robbie was actually a Nobel Prize winning physicist at Columbia. He worked over there in Pupin for many years. And when he was asked how come he was able to do such groundbreaking work to win the prize, as a good Jewish boy, he said it was all due to his mother. Mothers pay attention. Every day after school, he would sit down over milk and cookies with his mother and talk. And the key thing that she asked him was not whether he got a good grade on the tests or if he answered everything correctly, but rather, did he ask any good questions? So what's that good question that will drive us to the requisite new level of thinking about engineering? I think it's what makes a wise engineer. We must strive for that level of thinking that transforms the knowledge we have gained into wisdom. After all, we say that the highest degree in higher education is the PhD, the Doctor of Philosophy, from the Latin to teach and the Greek a love of wisdom. Wisdom requires that our evidence-based knowledge becomes embedded in a multi-dimensional ecosystem of understanding with other levels of thinking, including a dimension of ethics-based values such as humanity, humility, and honor, among others. In other words, I think knowledge requires an ethic to be used wisely. Now I see some eyes glazing over. This is the point where those few of you who are still listening to me will be saying to yourself, I don't care about that ethics stuff. If I'm technically as proficient as I can be, I have done my job. And my answer to that is, do you think of yourself as a technician or a professional? Engineering is defined in one dictionary as the application of science by which matter and energy in nature are made useful to people. I'm sure you would all agree that you should be as proficient in applying science to transform matter and energy. But the rest of that definition is equally important, if not more so, namely in a way that is useful to people. The decision about what is truly useful is a value judgment about what is good and bad. In other words, it requires incorporation of an ethics-based dimension as well as an evidence-based dimension in your framework of understanding. The linear dimensional framework of technical thinking, at which I am sure all of you excel, must be embedded in a multi-dimensional framework in which one of the other orthogonal axes is ethics, if you want to put it in engineering terms. The technical engineer stops at the linear thinking part, but the professional engineer operates in that larger framework. We all talk about an engineering profession, and in fact, in every state in the union, you can earn the legal credential of professional engineer. But what does being a professional mean? One thing it means is that not only have you been privileged, very privileged because you're here at Columbia, to acquire specialized skills and knowledge, but also that you recognize that that privilege comes with responsibilities, one of which is to use the skill and knowledge wisely in a way that is useful to people. Some of the engineers of a prior generation who designed and built the gas chambers for the concentration camps made them technically and frighteningly very efficient. But it would be difficult to say that they used their knowledge wisely or that they acted professionally. The challenge for this generation of engineers is to accept your professional responsibility and act wisely, tempering your technical prowess with ethics. This is the new level of thinking that is needed to solve the problems created as a result of the level of thinking we have done thus far. This old level of thinking has made a world that is profoundly technologically efficient in a way that is equally profoundly unjust and unsustainable. We have become so technologically proficient in manipulating matter and energy in nature to create and maintain our oversized ecological footprint of our Western lifestyle that we have in effect condemned a significant fraction of this generation to extreme poverty. Just as an example, consider that the average ecological footprint of the typical American, you, me, and everyone here, is five times that of the world average if all resources and ecosystem services were distributed equally around the globe. And it is 15 times that of the average eco ecological footprint of a typical citizen of the third world. And the solution is not merely one of making our current level of thinking about technology available to the rest of the world so that they can pursue our way of life, we have already exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity with this level of thinking. And it would require at least four to five planet Earths to do the same for the whole world's population. And as I recall, planets, good planets, are hard to find. 
which would only mean condemning future generations to global ecological catastrophe. So we need a new level of thinking that recognizes that technological efficiency in the service of the privileged few of this generation is unwise because it is unjust to the rest of humanity alive now and yet to be born. It's true that we must all change our level of thinking, but you as professionals with your specialized skills and knowledge have a responsibility to be leaders in this. You should show the way, you can show the way, you must show the way. Living up to your professional responsibility is not just about knowing, but about caring. Because in the end, people will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So there's a lot of hard work ahead of you. It's time is running short, as you heard, maybe two years, maybe less. So you better get started. That's why today is part of a commencement. It's really just a start. I do have every confidence that you will succeed because you don't only not know what you don't know, you don't know what you can't do. And that's good because you can probably do just about anything. But I also think the dean may have failed to mention the bad news. Although you will re be receiving your diplomas soon, you must pass one final exam before you fully deserve them. You didn't know that. Hmm. The good news is, it's a take-home exam. You get to grade it yourself, and you have a lifetime to complete it. If in 40 or 50 years, at the end of your professional career, you can look at yourself in the mirror and truthfully say that you've used your knowledge wisely to build a better world for all, then you will have earned your degree. So go build a better world. We're all counting on your leadership, your professionalism, and your wisdom. Thank you.